Father, again, we uh, just thank you for uh, your guidance and your direction. So lead us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, this next sheet is uh, really for the nerds. <laughs> I mentioned already a little about theories of atonement. I've talked mainly about um, PSA, penal substitutionary atonement, but that's only one of many theories of atonement. It's actually, at least the development of it is more recent than some of the others. So here are just some of the others and the history behind them. Uh, this is taken from um, Char Charles Ryrie's book on uh, Bible doctrine. Uh, so you can just look at this, and this is just for your, you know, those who, if you want to do any further study. Uh, so there's, you have the, the theory, the name of the theory, you have who, who was the original person who started talking about it, and then its main teaching. So you have Ransom to Satan, and first uh, written by Origen. So you can see the dates there, so that's, that's only a couple of centuries past the time of Christ. Uh, so it's the death of Christ was a ransom paid to Satan to satisfy any claim Satan had against man. Ultimately, Satan was deceived. The Bible does not say anything about to whom a ransom was paid. Recapitulation. Uh, Irenaeus was the guy who first started talking about that. Christ recapitulated in himself all the stages of life, including what belongs to us as sinners. His obedience substituted for Adam's disobedience, and this should affect a transformation in our lives. Satisfaction. Now, this is close to penal substitution. This is by Anselm. Um, the book that's mentioned there, Cur Deus Homo, is, is a famous theological writing. Um, anyway, sinful man robbed God of his honor. God rewarded the death of Christ by viewing it as a work of super irrigation so that he can pass on its stored up merits to us. Faith is necessary to appropriate this. So basically, the death of Jesus Christ satisfied uh, God the Father, uh, but he didn't put a lot of emphasis on, on individual substitution. And the emphasis more is on the merits that Jesus had as providing our righteousness, not just his death. So many people believe that, so, so if I were to ask you, what, what saves you? What saved you? You would all say the death of Jesus Christ. Would any of you say the life of Jesus Christ? Because that, that's, that's believed by many Christians, that not only the death of Jesus Christ provides for our salvation, our redemption, but the fact that he led a sinless life on this earth. And it's that sinless life that's uh, given over to us when we put our faith in him. So it's not just the death of Jesus Christ that saves us, but both his life and his death. The only issue with that is the scripture seemed to uh, put much more emphasis on the death of his the death of Jesus Christ as our salvation, as the source of our salvation. Okay, moral influence. This is from Abelard, uh, but then also elaborated by more modern theologians. Um, death of Christ was not an expiation for sin. Remember, expiation is where you pay for something. So that this view does not believe that, in a sense, the death of Jesus Christ was was the most important, it, it, it's not like his death gave anything to us, but uh, rather his death was a suffering. Jesus suffered with his creatures to manifest God's love. This suffering love should awaken a response of love to the, in the sinner, bring an ethical change in him. This then liberates us from the powerful power of sin. So that's why it's called the moral influence. Jesus' death was a moral influence to us. Then we have example, which is very similar to moral influence. Uh, Christ's death did not atone for us, but revealed faith and obedience as the way to eternal life and inspiring people to lead a similar life. 
the governmental theory of the atonement. God's government demanded the death of Christ to show his displeasure with sin. Christ also did not suffer the penalty of the law, but God accepted his suffering as a substitute for that penalty. Huh? He did not suffer the penalty of the law, but then he got... Yeah, he didn't really die under the law. He didn't, it wasn't, you know, the idea that Jesus took on our sin, therefore, because of the law, he, he took on the guilt of our sin. Whereas what this view is saying is it's not so much that he, his death did, had anything to do with the, the Old Testament law, but rather God accepted his suffering as simply the substitute. As I said, these, the, these are very nerdy stuff. And, you know, you could, you could read this and do like you just did, huh? <laughs> That's a normal response to a lot of these things. <laughs> Okay, uh, dramatic, or this is often called the Christus Victor view. This is a very popular view right now. In modern Christianity, Christ in his death gained victory over the powers of evil. So in other words, his death uh, uh, beat Satan, basically. And basically, uh, by his death and resurrection, Jesus was thumbing his nose at Satan. And he was saying, okay, I, I win. You thought you were going to be the victor, but I'm actually the victor. What's that? Yeah, there's only part. So you, you can see how a lot of these take parts of the story. But then even when you come to a penal um, substitute uh, theory of the atonement, that's just part two. There's other parts. And that's why... Some people will totally throw out PSA because they, they think it's so bloody, they think it's so um, unfitting for such a loving God to do such a thing. And yet, like I said before, there's just too many scriptures that, that uh, uh, bring, bring that out. So then you have the Bartian view uh, given by Bart. Uh, so this is a little more modern. Christ's death was principally a revelation of God's love and his hatred of sin. So you can see how in modern Christianity that's, that's very popular. People want to talk about the love of God, but they don't want to talk about his death and resurrection. They, a lot of people will say, yeah, I like, I like Jesus' teachings, but don't tell me all this stuff about who Jesus is and that he's God and all that. We don't really know that, is what they would say. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's the danger of them, is that, that they could become that way. But I think there's a passage in Peter that basically said that, uh, you know, Jesus' death on our behalf is our example of how to live. In other words, we should live a, a sacrificial life, a suffering life, what people will call a Christocentric life. We're to live, as Christians, we're to live a Christocentric life. Well, what does that mean? Well, Christ came and suffered and died. I was reading some article and basically they said, uh, there, for the Christian, there is never any happily ever after on this earth. If anything, for the Christian, it's just the opposite. Jesus told us we would be persecuted, we would suffer, we would have hardship on this earth. So that we don't like to hear that, and even though we know that, what, what are we always striving for? We're always striving to make our life better on this earth. And, you know, we want both... You know, when we talk about eternal life, um, we all know it's not just a future thing, but more and more I think a lot of Christians um, enjoy their life here on this earth so much or want to make it so good that they don't think about heaven at all. They don't have a hope for the future. Sure. Now, as you, as you see the realities of life, as you see the suffering of this world, and as you see the terrible things that go on, all of a sudden heaven... <laughs> Heaven becomes a lot more glorious, and the desire for heaven becomes more. Um, and, and don't ever worry that, that it's a form of escapism. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I want to add, you know, wouldn't you escape suffering if you could? Well, of course you would. There's nothing wrong with escaping hardship, pain, suffering. Uh, just because the Bible says we're going to be, we're gonna be persecuted doesn't mean we should go in and, you know, 
make ourselves so obnoxious that people are going to persecute us. And that's what some Christians do. They'll do something really stupid. They'll say something stupid. They'll offend, offend people. And then they'll say, oh, they're persecuting me. Praise God, I'm being persecuted. And you want to go, you're just being persecuted because you're stupid. And um, so, so just because there's going to be suffering and persecution doesn't mean we go after it. We seek after it. But we should never be afraid of it. We should never have this... Uh, this kind of false optimistic view that this earth is always going to, will get better and better and that life will always be better and better. The reality is for your generation, the hope is that you're not going to make as much money as my generation did and have the successes we had. But then a lot of it is life is different. The, the whole workforce is different. You don't, very few people today join a company, stay with that company 20, 30 years, get a gold watch and a retirement pension at the end. Just don't do that anymore. See, you, you, we have what's called the gig economy. You, you t do all these kind of odd jobs and you get paid uh, through the internet. You don't even get a check anymore. See? It's a lot so yeah, it's, it's just different. But because of that, um, there isn't the security that there was when, when I was your age and looking forward to, okay, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And you join a, a you know, good company, get on their pension plan, you move up the ladder, stuff like that. It, it, that's just not how your generation thinks anymore, which is fine. I mean, that's because it's, it's not how it is. But because of that, like I said, there isn't the same kind of security. But, like I said, with Bart, uh, a lot of people like to stress the love of God. Uh, and they tend to think talking about the crucifixion is not a very lovely thing. Well, if we know what the end result of that is, it is a very beautiful thing. But, but that's where I think people fall short. They don't see what the end result is. And then final, the, one, the final one we have here is penal substitution, which we've talked about. You'll notice that, that uh, Rari puts Calvin, John Calvin, as the one who kind of developed this. There were um, seeds of penal substitution in the early church fathers, uh, but it wasn't actually until the reformers, Martin Luther as well as Calvin, that, that kind of gave greater detail for that. Christ the sinless one took on himself the penalty that should have been borne by men and others. There's other theories. One of the more recent ones is, is what's called, we talked a little about it, the scapegoat, where the emphasis is that Jesus is the scapegoat that goes off into the wilderness. So again, you could see that the, they want to avoid uh, the bloody death of Jesus, but they still want Jesus to, to take away our sins. Uh, this scapegoat theory is, I think, uh, uh, René Girard was the first one who came up with that. And it's a very popular one among uh, those who call themselves progressive Christians. And it's often a reaction to penal substitute atonement. So th th this is why you have to kind of look why people believe the things they do. And it's amazing how... Some people who grew up in evangelical play, um, churches and families um, feel that they were not told the truth, they weren't told everything, that they were, in a sense, made to believe certain things without ever challenging them. And so they almost have a hostility toward evangelicalism. And, and to me, that's really sad. It's, it's kind of like... You know, you can understand when people change, and, and sometimes when people change, whatever they had in the past, they, they turn against it. They hate it. They become kind of the spokesman against it. A lot of times, as some of these people who grew up in evangelicalism, and they describe what they grew up in, and I grew up in evangelicalism, and I say, I, that was nothing I saw. But then I realized, as I talked to my sisters, they had a different view of how they grew up in evangelicalism, so they, they've drifted away from, from it more, you know, more. So I, a lot is your perspective, a lot of it is what you experience, what you feel like, but that's why it's really important to understand the truth and then to try to live out that truth as best as you can in your own personal life and in, in church. Um, and then
then, you know, when, when people say things that are not scriptural, you say, well, wait a second. Yeah, a lot of Christians may believe that and act that way, but that's not necessarily scriptural. And, and help people distinguish between what is essential and what isn't. So, okay, any questions on the theories of atonement? Like I said, this is really nerdy stuff. So some of you might say, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to find out more about it. Others are going to say, well, I'm going to file that under trash can. <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the big question. Big question. Well, big issue. We're going to talk about election and Whoa. man's responsibility. And again, this can be really uh, theoretical, uh, really mind-bending. So if it gets too hard for you, just lay your head down, take a nap. <laughs> Or ask me a silly question, get us off track or something. So, anyway, the title is God's Election, Man's Responsibility. When I have the term God's Election, I'm also including uh, predestination, foreknowledge. So, that's what we're going to be talking about. And these are just my own personal random thoughts. So, if you when we go over this and you say, wait a second, I'm not sure I agree with that, that's fine. Or if you say, oh, I'm not sure that's even in the Bible, that's fine too. You can do your own research on it. But these are, these are thoughts I came up with because a lot of people um, have asked questions about this and it's not the kind of topic you can just kind of go, okay, here's the answer, give a two-minute thing and that's it. Uh, to me, there's a lot of layers to this whole topic, so that's why... I have all these things. So I start off uh, with a question. How do we reconcile God's predestination and man's responsibility? And the answer is you don't reconcile friends. And I, to me, you have to get away from the idea that these two things are contradictory issues. Now, obviously, there's, there's differences. You can make it a contradictory issue. But if you start off by saying, OK, if, if I maybe start off with the idea that these are both things that are in Scripture and that they're not meant to conflict with each other, then maybe that will help me to understand these things a little better, or at least to accept them better, rather than to think, I have to resolve this. I have to resolve in my mind how you can have the eternal sovereignty of God in predestinating and electing people, and does man still have a responsibility and a choice in the matter? But if you, if, you, if you see them as opposing each other, I think you're always going to be struggling with that. But if you see them as, um, as, as something that, that um, are com is complementary rather than opposing, as I say here, there are two rails of the same railroad, there are two sides of the same coin, then I think that's going to help, help us to understand it a little better. So the statement next I say is the Bible teaches both the sovereign will of God in all things, which includes his full omniscience and foreknowledge and his ordination of all things. You see, if you, if you downplay the sovereignty of God, if you downplay election and predestination, you, I, in my mind, you have to downplay his omniscience, you have to downplay his foreknowledge, you have to downplay his power and ability to act and do what we normally think that God can act and do. And so you have what's often called the, the, the God of process theology. That's a theology, kind of a modern theology that, that tried to reconcile these two issues. The way they came down on it is that God does not know the future because the future hasn't happened yet. And to process theology, God is a player in, in the way of the universe, just as we are, kind of. And their desire was to help people feel closer to God by bringing God down to mankind. And so to me, that's the, that's the fault of something like process theology. And, and uh, there's different stages of it, different grades of it. Um, 
And if you're, you're, if, if you are the person who falls very strongly on the sovereignty of God, uh, almost anything that denies his full sovereignty, you're going to, you're going to think is, is, is going away from true Christianity. Um, but to me, this is why you, I like to see them as, as complementary rather than opposing each other. Um, so the Bible teaches God's full sovereignty, but it also teaches the responsibility of mankind as a real choice. Now, I don't like to use the term free will because uh, most people, when they think of free will, they think, oh, we got the freedom to, to do anything. Well, that, that just isn't true. Did anyone here have a choice and a say in where you were born? No. Any of you have a choice or say into who your parents were? No. See, so right there, you, you, there's, there, there isn't a, a thing as absolute free will. But when it comes to salvation, I do believe that there's a real choice that we make. It's not necessarily something that's forced upon us or that we do when we don't want to do it. That's how some people think. Uh, in fact, I, I forget who it was that said, yeah, God brought me screaming and yelling into the kingdom of God, meaning he didn't want to come. And I wanted to say, I, I don't think that's true. I think when you finally put your faith in Jesus Christ, because you want to. Now, the question is, well, what made you want to? See, so that, that then brings in the whole issue of God's sovereignty and God's working in your life. How do we make the decisions we do? What causes us to make those decisions? What causes us to um, eat star fruit when maybe you've never had it before, see? What, what causes the idiocy that, that eats this, that kind of Cheetos that's so hot? <laughs> I used to like stuff like that, but... Uh, now it just comes out the other end, so it, it, it just, I, I, I use it as a cleanser for my, no, nah, we're good too. All right, so anyway, uh, that, I, I do believe that there's a real choice we make in a lot of things in life, but that, that to me is the real question, is why do we make the choices we do? Why do some people don't make the same choices that we think they ought to do? See, so that, that's really the question. So here's some definitions. Election. Election is an act, and I'm, I'm sorry if, if you feel like me just reading this is, is a waste of time. Um, but this way you, you can hear it as well as read it. And if you want to ask questions, you're welcome to do that. So election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. And that's a quote from... Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology. And if you want a one-volume Systematic Theology, an evangelical one, that's, that's a really good one to have. Um, so it's God's free choice of individuals to salvation. That's what election is. Closer related to election is what's called reprobation, which is often defined as the sovereign decision of God before creation to pass over some persons in sorrow, deciding not to save them and to punish them for their sins and thereby to manifest his justice. And then predestination, often used as a synonym for election, some see predestination as a broader term than election, and it includes both election and reprobation. General definition, God has a purpose that is determined long before it is brought to pass. God foreordains whatever comes to pass to pre-plan a destiny. And we, there's plenty of verses that talk about how before the foundation of the earth, God redeemed us or God saved us or God chose us, whatever the terminology is that they use. Now, when I talk about election and reprobation, some people, you, they define it as, they'll call it double predestination. In other words, you have those who believe are predestined to salvation. Those who don't believe are predestined to judgment and damnation. Now, if you believe in the 
total depravity of mankind, if we believe that we are born with sin in our lives, in one sense, we're all predestined to death the moment we're born. So even if you've been predestined before the creation of the world to be saved, are you saved when you're born? Well, no, because the Bible is very clear you have to have faith to be saved. So predestination, election, does not save you. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, but the reality is, don't think that just because someone is predestined before the dawn of history, that that makes them saved. See, that, that's why I say this stuff is, is kind of up there in the mind, can get kind of nebulous. But I think that's what a lot of people think. And so they think, oh, well, so God... Before we're even born, before people are all even on this earth, God goes, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you're saved and you're not. See, that's the image we get. And we get the image, okay, if I were made the team captain of a basketball team, we're going to play a little backyard basketball. And you know how you have the two captains, they start choosing who. Oh, so I get to choose. And how do we choose? Yeah, usually whoever's better. And so we then project onto God. That's how God chose. Or if he didn't choose it that way, and if we did say, well, maybe he didn't choose because of anything in us, so then he went eeny, meeny, miny, moe. In other words, it was just by chance. Well, no, the Bible is very clear that he chose out of the good pleasure of his will. He chose for his glory. And he chose being the God that he is, a God who is loving, merciful, kind, generous, righteous, holy. So all those things go into him making those choices. So we have to, we have to steer away from thinking when the Bible talks about God making these choices, predestinating, that he's like us because we're gonna, he's going to become a bad God when you do that, kind of. Because we find out that our choices are usually have a lot to do with our own self-centered ideas and thoughts. So that if we're picking a basketball team, our choice is to win. No one as the captain of a basketball team says, okay, I'm going to pick all the losers because they never get picked. Unless you're Rick. Well, unless you're Rick, okay. Well, well we one. yeah, you did something like that. Well, yeah, we do that as an illustration. But if you were doing this seriously, you just wouldn't do that. See? You know, we do that as an illustration. We do that because we want to show that we're generous or something like that. But God doesn't even choose people just to show that he's generous. He does it because he's, he's just God. So we don't know totally why he does that, what are the reasons for his choices, except that it says for his good pleasure. So, um, like I said, some believe that there's double predestination. I believe there's only, the Bible only talks about predest predestinating those to salvation, that, that it's all of us are born into this world headed for hell, headed for judgment. And God steps in to save some. Okay? Any thoughts, questions? All right, so next section, biblical passages on election predestination. Uh, they're all listed there so you could look them up. Um, doctrine of election summarized. Uh, I said this already, God's election is grounded in his own being, therefore election has to be comparable with all his attributes, so therefore it's done out of love and his display of his glory. God's election is of individuals. Some believe that our election is that he actually elected Jesus Christ, and those who put their faith in Jesus Christ are in Christ, therefore we're elected because we're in Christ. In other words, they would say that the election is not of individual people, but of Jesus and all those who are united to him in faith. 
Uh, but, but there are too many passages that talk about our individual election that God chooses individuals. So God's election is of individuals. His election is not based on foreknowledge. If you define foreknowledge as looking down the corridor of time, knowing what a person's going to decide to do. That's how some people define uh, God's election and God's predestination. That because God knows everything, he can look down the corridor of time and he knows if you're going to trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you're going to trust in Jesus, that's what causes him to elect you. But see, that's just backwards, right? According to the Bible, the election comes before that. So foreknowledge is not just looking down the corridor of time and being able to know the future. Foreknowledge has more to do with an intimate relationship that God has with his creation. So that even in, in uh, I think it's, it's um, 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, okay, First Peter. Uh, he starts off, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered through Pontius, then he names a bunch of places, and have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So, according to that passage, our election, our choosing of, by God is according to his foreknowledge. But don't think of foreknowledge, as I said, as simply looking down the corridor of time. His, God's foreknowledge is more about an intimate relationship he has with his creation. So that, that's what it means. And, and, and to, to say that God's election is based on him knowing that we're going to put our faith in him, in a sense, takes away from uh, what I what I believe true election is all about. Um, and that is true election that God chooses whom He wants and desires. All right, we're going to talk some more. About, I mean, we're going to go into that. But see, that's what election is. But but we're also going to see the Bible is very strong on man's responsibility. See, that, that's what I'm trying to say. You can't, you can't dilute either of these, I believe. Now, if in your mind you feel like you have to dilute it to, to, um, to bring these two together, to reconcile them together, then that's what you're going to do. But like I said, these are my thoughts. <laughs> and you can argue with them, that's fine. But this, I'm trying to say this is why, how I come to this and why I come to it. I don't want to dilute either of these. And for me to not dilute them, there is going to be a sense of mystery that goes on in here. OK, question over here um, or comment? Yeah. I feel like to say that God just looked forward in time and then saw who was going to believe in him like in the future and then just elected those people. Absolutely. So he's not predestined something to happen. He just knows what's going yeah. to happen. Yeah. So, so in other words, it's, it's simply on his foresight. So I don't even use the term foreknowledge because, I, like I said, I, the biblical view of foreknowledge is more than just looking into the future. Um, but it's, it's more the idea that, that God has this intimate relationship with his creation. So he understands all things. Now, because he understands all things, that, of course, is going to go into his decision on who he calls and who he chooses. But to, to say it's because he sees us that we would put our faith in Jesus, again, puts the emphasis on us. And the whole idea of God's election and choosing is the emphasis is on him. Okay. Some people would say that, and that's one of the misconceptions about uh, uh, predestination I'm going to talk about. 
But that's what happened in Jesus' time. The Pharisees thought they were God's chosen people for, and, and therefore they were better. So yeah, that's a danger of that. So you can, you can see how if you, if, if you have a certain view of predestination that God chooses some and he doesn't choose others, oh, that sounds like he's got favorites. Again, that's, that's looking at it from our human perspective, which is the only way we can look at it, okay? See, when I, when I say something like that, that's I saying, looking at it from a human perspective, I'm simply making an observation. That's, that's all we can do. But I don't think that's God's perspective. So I don't think we can say that God has favorites. In fact, the Bible is very clear. He doesn't have favorites, okay? And yet, he, it still says that he chooses some, but doesn't choose others, or overlooks others, I should say, if you don't want that strong terminology. Okay, so um, number four, God's election was before the foundation of the world. He did not choose us after we chose him. Jesus, again, was very clear. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So see, see it's verses like that that make you have to th say, okay, uh, the, the first choice was God's choice. Now, that doesn't nullify your choice. But let's begin with the beginning. The beginning is God made this choice before the foundation of the world. Um, number five, election alone does not result in the salvation of people. Election assures that those chosen will be saved, but it alone does not save them. People are saved through faith in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. We talked a little about that before. So here's, here's a question to ask. If somebody who was chosen by God before the foundation of the earth, what if they died before they put their faith in Jesus Christ? Are they saved? Would you allow that to happen? Well, that's a good response. See, that, that to me is the response to make. It's like, no, I don't think that's a, that's a correct category even to think about. That's basically saying, okay, so God starts this plan of salvation in this person's life but doesn't bring it to completion. What does that say about God? Yeah. Well, not so much a mistake, but there was something out of his control. Now, what I get bothered by a lot is if God predestines someone for salvation, but they're not saved till they come to faith, why is it that God has some people, they don't come to salvation until they're 40, 50, 60 years old. Others come when they're five. Why didn't they all come when they're five years old so they could live for Jesus Christ the rest of their life? That's what I struggle with. Because that's the choice part. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. See, that's, that's saying, okay, that just shows there's, there's, God allows for the choice of mankind to be involved here. But even man's choice. Still, also saying like at some point those people are going to choose him before they die. Okay, you yeah, but them to but, die before that happens. And it, exactly, but but see, th this is where where the question to me gets. You got to get to the next layer, and the next layer is okay. So what is it that causes a person to finally make that choice? And it's a number of things. It's more than just, well, God chose them and elected them and God did that. Because then I would say, well, why didn't he just do that when they were five years old? Well, because God in his sovereignty has some reason for doing all this. And how many testimonies have we heard of people who said, yeah, I heard the gospel, but I didn't believe. And I was very stubborn until one day it happened. I always want to ask, so what happened that one day? What was it? But see, that's, that's the kind of mystery part of it. Something comes into your life there where you finally say, that's it. I am going to believe this. You may have heard it all your life. You may have at one point said, yeah, one day I'm going to trust Jesus as my Savior. Now, right now. So, but one day that does happen. Okay. But to me, that takes away from understanding God's sovereignty as he's in charge and we're just robots. See, that, that to me is what tells me I have these choices, and these choices are real, um, but God is, in, is sovereign, and, and that's why I trust in him. See. Can we have faith without God giving it to us? Well, 
if you if you define faith generally, we have faith in a lot of things. You know, every, every time you drive on the road, you have faith that that person is going to stay in his lane, not come into your lane. I mean, specifically. Oh, uh, for have self, faith in, in Jesus yeah. without. Because I've been taught that faith is a gift that God yeah. gives. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a gift that God gives, then where is the free choice in that? <laughs> well, it's like I said the other day. You still have to receive the gift. See, until you receive the gift, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the question. When, when do you feel you became a Christian? Roughly. Were you young? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's say seven years old. Well, when you were five years old, so you grew up in a Christian home, went to a Christian church. Do you think you heard the gospel when you were five years old? Oh, yeah. I told Jesus I loved him, but I had okay. no clue of the gospel. Okay. So, th th I guess the point I'm making is that, that we, we have these stages in our life, in a sense. And, and so, did, do you think God was offering the gift of faith to you prior to seven? We don't know that. You're right. It's, it's one of those things where if you, if you use the illustration that faith is like a gift, it's like all of a sudden you discover this gift. And, and so as a kid, you discover this gift, and you ask your mom, Mom, how long has this present been here? And is the child thinking, this present's been here a long time. I just haven't seen it, or it just got here. Well, if, if we believe that faith is a gift from God, we could still look at it that way, that is it a gift that's been there, we just haven't seen it? And then now that we see it, are we going to just look at it? Or are we going to open it up? Well, it seems like See? we would have to just be there waiting. Otherwise, we wouldn't have an option. Okay. Choosing it. I, I agree with you. See, I, I think ever since the cross, God has basically said, here's my gift to the world. So, okay, but we'll be talking about a little, some of that a little more. So, um, see, where was I? Okay, number six, election is purposeful, not capricious. Its purpose for us is service and good works. Its purpose for God is to manifest his glory. And you've, I, I think all the verses are in there. Is that correct? Because I realize I have a, maybe a little different copy here. Okay. Oh, running out of time. Go ahead. One more question. We'll... Yeah. That says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Yes. the different wills of God. Is it God's sovereign will? Now, if you define sovereign will as whatever God wills comes to pass, which is the definition of God's sovereign will. Whatever God wills comes to pass. So you know that's the sovereign will of God. When I dismiss this class, it's God's sovereign will that I dismiss this class. But until I dismiss this class, see, that's a timing factor. Okay, that verse you specifically said, when it says that God desires, see, you, you, your quote was God wills that no one perish. Oh, it's all, yeah. See, some versions will say God desires. And so now we're talking the difference between desire and will. And so that's, that's your assignment for next week. What's the difference between God's desire and God's will? Can God's desire be thwarted? Is there any part of God's will that can be thwarted? If we say that the sovereign will of God is whatever he wills comes to be, does that mean we cannot resist his will at all? Okay, so that, you can think about that for a whole week if you want.
or you could just forget about it and we'll <laughs> bring it up next week. All right, how many of you are coming up to the North Shore for a Sunday night for the, all right, good. Mini golf and then a worship night. Oh, you guys even know about it? Most of us. Most of you? All right, look forward to seeing you then. All right, have a good week. Thanks for making our brains hurt. <laughs> well, good. Your brains need to be exercised. That's what school is for. I don't know, yeah, I'm kidding. Some days I'm like, no more, please. No more. Exactly. Well, you do have to absorb what you.